these stocks cannot find their bottom. It doesn't matter what's coming across the tape or if there's nothing coming across the tape. Today was not really the most exciting day for macroeconomic data, nor anything particularly eventful on the earnings front, Netflix aside. And still, the floor is not there. But in the absence of macro event risk, not surprisingly, the question is, well, if these markets don't like it to this extent, could we maybe see a bit of a respite on the growth side of things to bail us out? Perhaps maybe not even in the U.S. where the situation has been relatively encouraging already and is probably already baked in to some extent. Maybe a recovery in China can get everyone back in a good mood. And so that's what we're going to uh, talk about here today. We got some uh, numbers out of China this week that, on the face of it, present a veneer of improvement. And yet, there seems to be less than meets the eye. Once When we start to look a little bit under the surface, this is, of course, Macro Money. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. What we're going to do is we're going to unpack what came out of China this week. There was a lot of focus on other things. So we're going to take a look at what's actually come out that could be uh, read as positive. And then take a look at whether that actually means what it could or whether there's something more ominous under the surface, and then go right into the brass tacks. How do you actually trade this going forward? So let's begin with what we saw this week. First quarter um, GDP numbers uh, out of China this week, ostensibly better than expected. Markets were looking for 5% year-on-year growth. They got 5.3. As a matter of fact, the 5.3 was not only better than expected uh, in terms of the value, but also the direction. The expectations were that we would come down from 5.2 to 5. As it turned out, China's economy actually accelerated. Seemingly good news. Except if we were to just take a brief look under the surface. If we take a look here... What we find is that, in fact, the same issues that we've been having with China's economy pretty much for the past four quarters, almost since we had the uh, reopening occur belatedly, um, that not only continued here, it actually got worse. And that's what um, we see when we uh, take a look at this spread between nominal and real GDP. So let's let's unpack this for a moment. Nominal GDP is the gross domestic product measure counting up all the goods and services produced in the economy. But when you do that, you inherently get a little bit of mud from the price of things. When you add things up, some of it may not necessarily tell you, oh, this is more stuff being made. This is just the price of stuff is higher. So it looks like GDP is going up, but it's going up because the prices of things are higher, not necessarily because actual stuff has become more abundant. You've made more things. People have gotten richer, et cetera. So real GDP extracts the price component. So you subtract the influence or the shading from inflation on overall output and say, okay, here's real GDP. This is the actual stuff, the actual output of goods and services that the economy has produced. So nominal GDP, which is the yellow line here, normally should be above real because the way you arrive at real is nominal minus inflation is real. What we're seeing here for now four consecutive quarters in China, right here, is that real is above nominal. That's not the way this is supposed to work. 
And what it means is what you're subtracting from nominal is a negative number. That's the only way you could get to a positive um, spread real to nominal. That's the only way real can run above nominal is if what you're subtracting from nominal is a negative number. Now consider what this means. You're saying that the price element here is negative, so China faces at an economy-wide, GDP-wide level, a deflationary gap, where the impact of this deflationary gap is increasingly shaving ever larger numbers from overall demand. What this is telling you is that demand is essentially absent in China's economy. What's worse is that in the first quarter, it was the largest of these four here, a gap of 1.2 percentage points of GDP, which is huge considering that we're talking about 1.2 percentage uh, uh, points in the growth of the world's second largest economy. Now, consider the sort of simple logic. How is this supposed to work normally? The price of things go up when there's a certain amount of things and lots of people want things, and then those people compete. Because there are only so many goods and services, and they compete on the price of those goods and services, the price then goes up. And those that are able to pay get it, and those that can't pay don't. When the price of things is going down, when there's deflation, what that means is that there is an abundance of things that nobody wants. And they have to be discounted to try to get somebody to buy them. This is bad news. This speaks to an economy lacking of demand. Not just in a localized way, not just in a here and there kind of way, but economy-wide. You see this in the latest numbers on actual inflation. So we see that China's uh, consumer price index has been essentially hugging zero. And it's been doing that really since the beginning of last year. We can see that China's producer price index, wholesale prices, they've been deeply negative they've rebounded a bit and now let's call it over the past year or so middle of last year approaching the middle of this year now flatlining right or right around uh two and a half percent or so in negative territory again this speaks to broad-based retail and wholesale demand destruction. This is not an economy that is able to create any kind of momentum. Now, in addition to these GDP numbers, we also got some uh, more timely numbers, uh, the March uh, economic activity numbers, and it's not any better. When we look at the retail sales report, the first thing, of course, that jumps out is that the numbers are going down and have been going down since November of last year. So we can see we, we go from 10% growth to 7.4% to 5.5% to now 3.1%. Now, not only are those numbers going in the wrong direction, they were also weaker than expected. At 3.1%, that's an undershot of what economists were looking for, which is 4.5%. It's the same story on industrial production. Steep decline in industrial production after some headier numbers uh, toward the end of last year, down uh, to 4.5% year-on-year growth, and that missed expectations. The expectation was 54 so we're in a situation here 
where the incidentals, the kind of more active, more timely numbers around the story in GDP, seem to confirm that indeed domestic demand is fizzling. What's interesting is the part that isn't going the wrong way is capital expenditure. Uh, Fixed asset investment is um, essentially the building of the capital stock in China. So cities, factories, roads, bridges, airports, etc. Now, this is not an unfamiliar story for China. It has been the way that China has manufactured economic growth for years, where what they do is they go and they say, okay, we're going to build a whole bunch of stuff and we're going to put the country to work. We're going to get people to go and um, build things and be employed. Never mind that we don't necessarily know if we actually need all of this stuff. We're just going to go do it. And in doing that, we're going to create economic activity. Generally speaking, this was financed with borrowed money and financed with um, very favorable capital um, allocation, in particular to local governments, by uh, the authorities, essentially to create activity, to manufacture activity. And you're seeing that attempt here. I mean, clearly the economy has been anemic since uh, reopening. uh, And it seems like we're going back to a familiar sort of a playbook here where the authorities are saying, right, um, it's not working. There's no retail sales. There's no industrial production. GDP has this deflationary gap in it telling you that there's not demand in the economy. Let's go create that demand. Let's go and start to build out stuff. And that will create a level of activity. The problem with doing this is that what you need is a source of capital to backstop all of these outlays. And historically, what China has relied on is, of course, its export engine. In fact, that's sort of the impetus for how China's economy has worked really since um, the 90s, maybe even a little bit earlier, where China has ass- had essentially made the, the sale that they will be the value-add center for the world because what they have in abundance, the, re- the resource they have in abundance is labor. And so what should happen, the pitch that they made and made successfully was raw materials will come into China, semi-finished materials and goods will come into China, China will apply its vast army of labor to finishing or more so finishing whatever is there and ship it on to um, end demand markets or to whatever is the final stage of production before something is sold. And what that meant, of course, was a ton of capital inflow because China ran dramatic trade surpluses with the West. What it also meant was there was this flow of capital constantly to backstop the government basically splashing out on these kinds of things, on building out the country. Well, the problem is that this is now going in the wrong direction. So we can see here, not only is domestic demand down, you can see imports are trending lower. And that, by the way, is not just domestic demand for consumption in China, it's also tracking those imports that are inputs into the value-add, middle-of-the-global supply chain story that we've just described. Exports are down both negative in the most 
recent data and the trend clearly pointing in the wrong direction. So that source of underlying capital to underpin this thing isn't there. As a matter of fact, if we wanted to see sort of the most ominous reflection of this, we can see it in China's cumulative foreign direct investment. Capital is fleeing China at a staggering rate. I mean, these are year-on-year percentages. Needless to say, double-digit declines in year-on-year foreign direct investment means that the kind of capital cushion, the kind of offsetting positive capital flows that need to exist for the government to comfortably say we are going to go splash out on infrastructure and other, and other capital expenditures, it isn't just not there. It's going the other way. And so what it seems like we're looking at here is a house of cards waiting to unravel. Now, this is not the story that's afoot if you were to ask Chinese stock market. We can see here that since the beginning of the year, FXI, the um, ETF tracking Chinese large cap stocks here, has actually marked a recovery. Now, it is getting stuck at um, this former support become resistance here right around the $25 uh, a share level here. So maybe it's running into a wall, but the story has been of a series of lower highs and lower lows becoming overturned, especially as we start March. So there is the appearance that actually things are improving, that actually things are doing better. But of course, we also know that not a few months ago, Chinese authorities decided that they were going to direct the investment arm of the Sovereign Wealth Fund to go and buy domestic stocks. The so-called home team was out in force and has been plainly directed It was a sacking of the um, head of the uh, securities regulator. Somebody else got installed. And then there was a clear directive made to publicly. This is certainly no conspiracy theory. This is statements made with the world uh, attentive to go out and buy local shares to prop up local markets. So if one were to take a bet or want to take a bet on China's house of cards unraveling, this perhaps is not the place to do it. In fact, uh, Chinese shares are probably not the place to do it because a buyer with maybe not bottomless, but close to bottomless pockets, especially in a a uh, closed-to-capital flow uh, economy like China, has been directed to keep this from getting meaningfully weak. But there is another vehicle, a vehicle where Beijing's um, interventions don't extend. And that is the Australian dollar. Australia is uh, China's largest trading uh, partner for raw materials, to be sure on the import side, and China is Australia's largest uh, trading partner for what it sells. Uh, And that, of course, is coal, iron ore, various metals. And so there's a great deal of sensitivity for the Australian dollar to China's business cycle because so much of Australian economic growth depends on digging up everything that can be dug up in Western Australia, essentially loading it up on a ship and sending it to Shanghai. So with that in mind, the sensitivity of Australia's business cycle to any kind of a rupture in China means that you then have extension 
into weaker economic growth, weaker inflation, and rate cuts. And of course, speculation around these very things is how you arrive at a lower Australian dollar, which just happens to have cracked the range bottom that's held here since early February, right around 64.50. In fact, not only has it cracked, but it appears to have withstood a retest. It tried to get back up over it and couldn't do it. So it seems like what we may have now is an opening to extend this decline at least down into, let's call it, the 63 area. Needless to say, it doesn't hurt the cause that as all of this is occurring, Fed rate uh, cut expectations are evaporating. In fact, uh, looking at the outlook at the close of business on Wall Street today, Fed funds futures are pricing in 32 basis points in cuts this year for the Fed. That's one whole cut of 25 basis points, and a mere 28% chance of a second one. Whereas the Fed, on March the 20th, when they updated this forecast, had 75 basis points. Needless to say, this has been in the dollar's favor, the U.S. dollar's favor. And so if one were to trade this China story, it isn't Chinese assets that look particularly attractive, but rather this currency market reflection that seems like a way insulated from Beijing's meddling, and with the added kicker that the the winds of change in Fed policy odds are also at one's back. And that is macro money for Today, this is our last show for this week. We are here Monday through Thursday after overtime, show that I co-host with Dylan Radigan and Chris Vecchio, looking at the Wall Street close and what may follow. I'm back on with Chris tomorrow, though, for Futures Power Hour, as I am every Friday. Back on with Tom and Victor for First Call on Sunday. I'll be on with with Victor as well uh going forward for the price of truth on Wednesday evenings. I'm also writing for the news and insights portion of tastylive.com and opining on Twitter or the platform formerly known as sporadically um, at Elias Feedback. Thanks very much for joining. Macro Money's back next week. Futures Power Hours tomorrow. See you then. Happy trading.